awesome. Perfect, everybody. Um, here we go. So we were last off at what is a transition? So just to kind of give you guys a recap uh, for Thelma and Les, I'm not remembering if you were here or not, probably yes or no. Last week, yes, you were here. Uh, but Thelma, we were trying to kind of get a better understanding of what transitioning looks like. So we were passing kind of what is ABA and kind of the different programs we offer. And then I kind of just took a peek to kind of have you guys understand a little bit about why and when people should leave intensive behavioral therapy and kind of the pluses and minuses of each system. Um, and kind of what to consider when you're recommending for a family, what to move, um, kind of what school setting is appropriate for them, pre-RONA life, post-RONA life, I don't know, we're gonna see. Just, we're taking a wait and see approach with that. Um, I don't know if I have feedback on somebody's, just by any chance. Awesome, okay. Um, and so then we left kind of at when to transition from intensive hours or what's considered comprehensive care to focused care. So insurance uses like those two terms interchangeably. So intensive or focused or comprehensive or focused care. All right, if anyone wants to volunteer, who's gonna tell Telma what is comprehensive care? Comprehensive care is 25 to 30, 32 hours? 40. 40, okay, 40. <laughs> hours of what? Uh, direct therapy. Yep. Oh, well, including, would that include the parent training? Generally not, the BCBA hours no. are not generally included in that. Okay. Uh, I will tell you this, you will hit a red flag number if your total hours hit over 40. Yes. You will definitely hit a red flag with the insurance company if you do that. Um, but, you know, if it's 30 hours and six hours of supervision and three, you know, um, three hours of parent training, you should kind of be okay because you're in the three to nine range. Um, but try, not, try to always avoid that your whole package is over, under 40 hours because you're going to hit like red flag, red flag. Yeah. Okay. And then focus care would be what, guys? Twenty-four and under, or twenty-one. It's around 20. feet, around feet, like ten, fifteen hours a yeah. week. It would be and it's more focused, like on one area. For example, we're working on social skills only, or and comprehensive, like cover the whole thing, rather than focus just focus on specific areas of. Um, so no, comprehensive stuff. and focus has nothing to do with actually what you're working on because it has to be individualized. So per like the Mental Health Disparity Act, it has to be individualized to the person. It only has to deal with the amount of hours of treatment you're allocating. So 20 and under is focused, 25 and over is comprehensive. Between 20 and 25 hours, it depends the insurance where they're gonna nitpick you. But that's a very funky hour range to place on a child. So, and it's funny, you're more likely to get flagged there and over 40 than you would at 30. I don't know why but it's kind of a, a freaky kind of weird in between sort of hours because it's generally not focused and it's generally not comprehensive. So they really want to get an understanding of what you're aiming to do with that client. Okay. So that's sort of the recap, Thelma. Um, I got a channel and so we put it up there. So it should, you know, if you need to recap it, you all you have to do is just hop on the channel and I'd be happy to share it with you. And you're, you know, you could just watch the previous recording just to get a full, complete idea of what we were talking about. So just to give you guys an idea, I am only going to give you the transitions mainly for public school settings. It is for the most part like this in private school settings in terms of you have a self-contained classroom or an integrated mainstream classroom. Um, I use sort of the everyday terminology that we have, but they're technically not called that. Jessica can give you the latest name of what we call a cluster classroom. I think it's like an ASD. Um, self-contained. It's still self-contained, okay. Yeah, uh, an ASD self -contained. unit. That's a yeah. <laughs> self-contained cluster, now it's self-contained. I don't know, they change the name every five minutes. And then a mainstream classroom, I don't think it's considered a mainstream classroom. I think they call it a it, it's a general ed, but with an, it's an inclusion setting. An inclusion setting. 
So yeah. you're going to kind of see one of those two styles of classrooms, even within private school. The only exception might be what's considered a homeschooling club. That's starting to gain a bit more popularity, especially after COVID. Um, basically, it's like a group of parents that will sponsor or pay a teacher or a placement or they will rotate and then help their children kind of homeschool. That's kind of a whole different beast in itself because it's very much individualized to what each homeschooling up and co-op is going to kind of make the rules and that's independent to that. Okay. And you have it, anyone have any questions? Nope. All right. So we want to really consider and understand why each classroom is considered for a child. So if the rate of learning is similar to neurotypical development uh, at the same age. So we're trying to consider, is this child's rate of learning similar to that of neurotypical peers um, at their developmental level? And are their rates of behavior not impeding the learning environment? Um, and can a non-behaviorally trained instructor carry that within the classroom? Then we're going to recommend a mainstream classroom. Let me kind of give you the point of contention where most parents kind of don't understand. Um, I would say more <laughs> often than not, I would see children who do have a rate of learning similar to their neurotypical peers. That isn't the issue. I would say more often, I see that the parent doesn't understand that the child is within a context that affects other people, right? This is kind of like the big debate in the United States, right? Like, where do my mm. rights end and yours end? Well, technically, my rights are until they begin to affect yours. So even if your child is learning at the rate of other neurotypical peers, if he cannot, he or she cannot contain themselves to act with what are considered the foundational behaviors, which means stay in their seat, complete their work with some redirection, um, work with others, have very low rates of inappropriate behavior, your child is not eligible and it's not well for them to be in a mainstream classroom. And just can probably attest to this because she's kind of in this field that's where it's more of the back and forth than anything else like we have parents that always 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 want to push their child to be in a mainstream inclusion classroom but don't understand that piece your child is a child that's in a classroom anywhere between 17 to 30 children that cannot be the teacher's priority i cannot put an aid full time for that like that is a very very big and your child is compared. They, on they fight you on it. Yeah. They, uh, they fight you. They fight you on it. And the, and the thing is that also because um, there's there's a policy in place that their homeschool has to provide the service. Mm -hmm. And so what I see a lot is the child, the behavior, like teachers not equipped to handle that, especially when it impacts all the other children. Um, and parents will fight you on it and they'll keep them in the school. And, you know, we will say it's not the right setting for you and, and they'll fight you on it. Yeah. And it only and, comes and to always... the cost of the child, really. So yeah. I have a quick question. Um, what, what exactly is our role there? Because they also have the evaluation from the school, right? Um, so we like give like our, our advice on it or how? What's what is actually it's our, our role as a, as a BCBA? Great question. I would say our advice it still has first and foremost the way that we should act comes on the professional and compliance code, right? We need to look out for the best interest of the client, even if it goes against the parents' wishes. It is our responsibility to look out for the best interest of the client. Now, that I feel like takes some finesse, rapport building with the parent. Yeah. If you kind of are fresh and new to the game, I still wouldn't kind of be intimidated by this. You should develop a good rapport with your parents. Let me say, for 98% of them. 2% are always going to be 2% and 2% you cannot change. That is like a, you know, human statistic curve, like 2% is always going to be over there on the left. Um, so I'm not really worried about the 2%. I'm worried more about the 98. I would say the... The challenge I've seen most BCBAs face is that they don't have this conversation with people before the IEP meeting or before the school transition. And so the parent doesn't know what to expect. They're going based on kind of what they've heard other parents say, possibly an advocate, you know, what their understanding of the school system is when they really have 
very little education on what the school system is. I'm talking about people in early stages of, when you're talking about somebody who's in middle school, sometimes they have a better idea of they've been through this a couple times. But most of the times they haven't been through this. They don't really know what the, the policies and the procedures are. They don't understand what part C is, part B. The procedural guidelines are 64 pages. Nobody in their right mind reads that. Like they don't understand that. Um, they don't understand what the government entitles them to through the IDEA Act and what is appropriate and what is kind of within the specific context of the resources the school has to supply. So sometimes people are looking for the school to do too much. Sometimes it's too little. Most of the time it's too much. A few times it's too little. Um, sorry. <laughs> this, is, this subject is very interesting to me because I, um, I'll share that with you. I have a son in this spectrum and actually my little one also is a, in a special program. So I've I had like many IEP meetings. <laughs> And I also like uh, have a clients in this situation. And one thing that I see happening a lot um, is that they hire an advocate and the advocate is always um, pushing for- What the parent wants. Usually. The mainstream. And then you're in the middle of that because you have someone who is very knowledgeable about the laws and everything. Right now I have a case like that. Like, that um, she's like, no, he has to go right now because um, after fourth grade is very difficult to go back and and then parents are pushing for that, but he, he's... He's not ready. No. And I think the difficulty is understanding the advocate's job, right? When I hire an advocate as a parent is for them to advocate for the best needs of my child. However, most of the time, the advocate doesn't even know your child. Enough out of two or three meetings. So what they're trying to kind of, I, I would say a good advocate, what they should do is teach you what the system is like so that you can make the best informed decision of your child. What I tend to see most is it's kind of like a one-time fee, just so you guys are kind of aware, an advocate can cost anywhere between like 700 to $1,000 per school year. So it is, I mean, and they work probably like a few times. It's like, geez, I wish I could pay $900 to like go to three meetings. Like I'd be really rich, but in order to kind of take the volume and do what they need to do. And obviously they have a specialty. I'm not saying they don't have their place. However, I do think it's a very critical error that they do not know the child. I kind of got into a really big, interesting kerfuffle. Maria was present there with the advocate. And at the end of the day, the advocate wasn't even advocating for my client's well-being. They were advocating and in the part of the school because the school told the parent to hire the advocate which I think is the most insane thing ever because usually schools hate advocates. So the fact that the school ha told the parents to hire the advocate, I was like, why on God's green earth has that ever happened? So yeah. Like, you know that like in Broward County, it's always the same advocates. Cause correct. they're, correct. they're well like, no. It's a group of like four or five of them that they all trade off. So I've kind of seen most of them through my career. Palm Beach works like that too. Cause they used to work up in Palm Beach. Um, and Dade has a few, like a couple, a couple more. Um, but I would say it is our well-being, our, I'm sorry, our priority to look out for the well-being of our clients. So if, if the advocate is saying it's very difficult to transition after fourth grade, you say, I can't predict what happens in fourth grade. I have to look out for what is for today in the best interest of what it is to, for fourth grade. Because if your battle, for example, is that in fourth grade, you want to mainstream your child because they've caught up with communication, cognition, you can make a really good argument for that. But if your child, for example, can't sustain himself to follow a classroom schedule. So that's what the other thing too is parents are uninformed of what does kindergarten look like? So I try to explain to them, your child needs to be seated a, a minimum in a mainstream classroom between 25 and 30 minutes. Can your child sit without a therapist there 25 to 30 minutes? No, usually the answer is no. Um, can your child follow routine directions with only one repetition? That's, so you need to kind of list out what are the prerequisites of being in a mainstream classroom. So I'm, I haven't listed these out here. Somebody, if you'd like this as an indirect project, it would be a great thing for you to kind of see. Um, if you're ever able to observe a kindergarten classroom, whether private or public school, they generally run the same, right? You need to be able to follow simple instructions. You need to follow two-step instructions. You need to be able to sit 25 to 30 minutes. You need to be able to communicate your needs and wants. Generally, you need to be toilet trained unless there's some sort of like medical, like, uh, 
incognizing or, or you know some sort of kind of condition that a person can't necessarily um like there was a classroom that had a CP student in it. Obviously, they have a medical condition. Why are they have incontinency? That's not what I mean. But generally, those children are toilet trained. Those children have to be able to turn in work on time. Think about even kind of kindergarten on Zoom now. <laughs> right? Like, what does that look like for this? So it's you know trying to have the parent understand. I get it. The cluster isn't. It's not always gained the best of fame in terms of the best learning environment. But if your child requires more support, the designated setting within a public school setting is in a cluster classroom, in a self-contained classroom, which means that they will have more supports from more adults in an individualized educational plan. And in that individual education plan, they will be able to better work in providing your child the, goal, the repetition of the goals that they need at that time. So I think we really need to see especially when it comes to behaviors. Can someone who isn't ABA trained deal with that child in a mainstream classroom? If they even, I even think about my higher functioning ones, right? I've had to train a lot of teachers and TAs that the child's perfectly capable and I would even say sometimes surpasses cognitively most of their peers. But if they have an emotional meltdown, they don't have no idea how to deal with it. Or they have so much out of seat behavior or they have like things that they're just like, I, I, I don't get it. Like, what is it like? We were talking about this and this kid kept perseverating on something else. Like, I don't know what to do. Um, or is getting bullied and I don't know how to handle that because this kid is not understanding social views. So you really want to kind of think now in that case, I would tell you even still mainstream classroom is appropriate because you can just it, the right, it's almost like the right setting is not in either. And that happens to a lot of kids. But when it's not in either, the more supported setting is what's recommended for the child. Unless you can get a very individualized education, maybe at a private school. So maybe for like a higher functioning learner, I would say having a much smaller classroom that's a mainstream classroom. So I can tell you now, like I work with a private school that they have seven children in one grade and in one classroom. What's, what's the amount that? of support <laughs> They're not in the U.S. I'll just tell you that. Not in the US. Unfortunately, it does not exist in the U.S. that I know of. But a Montessori style school that has maybe like 12 or 13 kids per grade, per class, that exists. And I know of like two or three I can name off the top of my head that do that. That but could I, be a support alert. Say that again? Like, um, I heard that Montessori, they're very like relaxed on the rules and everything and it's not good for our kids. But it depends. That's the problem with private schools, right? Like you may have one Montessori that follows one learning model and then another Montessori that follows. The true Montessori model that Maria Montessori developed has changed and evolved a lot in the last 100 years. So it just depends, right? Like I know of a Montessori school that was a perfect fit for this specific child because they didn't have issues following instructions and rules. They just needed more flexibility and time. And we created an IEP because they don't even have things like that. They followed it beautifully. And this kid was much better matched at that Montessori because there was structure, but there was flexibility within the structure. And then, I mean, they even helped make him a room and a space when he needed to stand because he just liked to do this. Like, and then he came back in and he was good. Um, really worked on eating and social skills within eating. Very high emphasis in, on that. So they had to learn how to microwave things, how to set a place setting and you know, a whole table for everyone. I mean, they set a tablecloth to eat. I thought that was like lovely. And you had a bunch of like kinder, kindergarten to second grade and how he would progress as long as he met his milestones, it was okay. Like if he needed to work on addition two extra weeks, then he worked on addition two extra weeks, which is a really beautiful flexibility that a lot of yeah. times you, you don't get at a public school setting. Nope. But that was that specific Montessori, right? So that's why I always say it just depends. So you have to be very, very open and willing to kind of look at different options. And then there's also very good like public school teachers that will do that accommodation because they maybe they have a child on the spectrum, you don't know, or maybe they've also worked with other kids and they're really good supported inclusion classrooms that can do that for your child. Um, so that's something you really kind of want to look at. Now you want to recommend the self-contained clusters if the child's um, developmentally not at the same level or acquiring skills similar to neurotypical peers and if they're displaying inappropriate behaviors that would impede the learning environment not just to themselves but to other people you're 
this isn't the house where I can like kind of help your kid and do things. Like I also have to consider the needs of 25 other kids. So that means that if your kids vocally stem super high during an assessment, I can't have your kid in the middle of an, of a mainstream classroom. It just doesn't make sense because everyone else doesn't have to be subject to the mercy of your child's vocal stemming. That's not fair to them. I mean, maybe we can make an accommodation that they get testing outside elsewhere, but you have to think about that too. It's not just about your kid. The school has to also not think just about your child, but also learning needs of everyone else within that classroom. So this kind of comes to your um, question, Delma, like who determines that? The parents, the school psychologists, the BCBAs, the neurologists, OT, speech, and the IEP advocate will kind of all maybe sit on this team. Um, later on, maybe a psychiatrist or a medical board team if they need it. Um, but at the end of the day, if you're transitioning the child between the ages of three and five, child find will make the last necessary. So the school will always stand by its placement. They'll say, hey, we want to put your child in a self-contained classroom. And then, you know, in the IEP meeting, if the advocate and the parents like, no, 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 they should be in a mainstream classroom. It could be the case that they try it out, but they're going to say that the recommendation was a self-contained cluster. Mm -hmm. And if your child does not thrive, because this is where you might be shooting yourself in the foot. If your child does not do well, it might take you longer to retransition them into a cluster classroom because another IEP meeting needs to be called to change the placement of that child, all right? And that doesn't happen in five minutes, right? Everything, one of the big lessons we learned is public schools, their clock runs very different <laughs> than everyone else's clock. So things are not like, oh, I complained today and I get it tomorrow. It doesn't work like that. Unless maybe you know someone on the school board, then it can work like that. You could, you could, but I think it depends on how good your ESC department. Mm -hmm. But let's say like, if this, if your school doesn't offer, like my school doesn't offer self-contained. Mm -hmm. So if you were going from, let's say like my school, like just an inclusion model to a self-contained, that will take a little bit longer. Yep. But normally if you offer the program, it shouldn't take long. But what you mean by shouldn't take long isn't what a parent hears when it shouldn't take long. When a parent yeah. hears it shouldn't take long, it usually means a week. Yeah. That's not what it yeah. means when it's schools. So that's a big thing. Like we deal with a lot. And this is where I would say is the biggest point of contention I have with public school systems is they do not speak in specified dates. And yeah. like, at the end of the day, we're all scientists. We're data driven. Like we like clarity. We like clear, concise, and objective. It's not going to take that long. I don't know what that means, right? Like yeah. I was in a meeting and I was saying, hey, an AAC evaluation from the AAC team who told me, who well, there's only one that runs it in Broward County and I've talked to the ones in Miami data it's around the same time, takes about a year and a half to two years. So when I'm sitting across an ESC director who's telling me, no, I could do it in a year. No, you can't. Like it'll be done before the end of the year. No, it will not. Don't lie to the parent if they're looking for that, because then they can actually get better viable resources if they know the yeah. actual timeline. But don't speak to me, oh, it'll get done. So I was really happy and thankful in this next meeting that I had with the person, they were like, hey, your child is in line, we've suspended this because of COVID. So they gave a lot better clarity to when the next evaluation was happening. And it's not like, oh, it's gonna happen at some magical time in Fali Lali Land where papers like don't exist or I can't follow up you have to be on top of things. Like that's part of your job as a parent. So I just like the school to be very honest with people. I don't know why they don't just tell them, hey, it takes around a year and a half to two years. Probably because every parent would freak out in the world when you say that's really the realistic timeline. So that we speak in a lot of abstract terms and I, I'm just not about that. Because information that's is power and that's true. Power. We can make better decisions and for your child when we have the actual information. Okay. Yeah, that is true. <laughs> so let me kind of give you guys a little bit of a better understanding of what is child find. So um, then you might be familiar with this process. I don't know if your child did early steps and then kind of transitions to child find. So I'm kind yeah. of that you were here. I'd love to hear kind of your role. Of, what do you understand child find to be as a parent? Ooh, I'm sorry. Can you repeat the question? Sure. How did you find, like, do you have a good understanding of what child find does? Or is? Yeah, like they were the ones, like in my case, my child was 18 months, actually. Oh, they so you started really steps. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they did the evaluation, red flagged him for autism, and then recommended um, 
it was not ABA, it was... Um, ITDS. Some other kind of something. <laughs> now, looking back, it's like even funny. But then he, he had that um, till he was three, and then he transitioned to school at three. Like mm -hmm. he began very early, actually. Um, yes. And uh, yeah, so when at three, child can stops, it stops all services, and they send you to school. So. Kind of. So <laughs> here's the technical name so you kind of know. Early steps is what to, who took care of your little one before the age of three. Child fine, I like to best describe them as a trampoline. So everyone, here, here's like the best way you can remember what child fine is. Between early steps and school, you need a trampoline. The trampoline to get from one stage to the other is child fine. They are the agency in charge of doing the evaluation and placing your child into part B, which is considered the, the county public school system. You do have some cases, you do, that will be home care because of kind of medical complications or something else. That is rare, like very rare. Most so of if the time, you want, mm -hmm, go ahead. So if you want to place it, for, for example, if you like your child is on the spectrum mm -hmm. and he's now four, and you want him to play the school. Child find is kind of required step to be to right. your child to be placed. So All it's right. like before, so you can't just go to school. Okay, I want this kid to be placed in the school. You need to go to child find. They need to evaluate you. And then you can express your like concern. Oh, I want to this school or that school. And that. Yeah. Um, so then what child find does, and by the way, I found out something very interesting. If your child is within four to six months of turning five, Child fine will no longer screen your child. Okay. So it's technically, it should be between three years old and five years old, but it's not. It has to be like three to four and a half. Because then they say, well, no, your child is already almost at school. Let school evaluate him. And that's when you have to wait another 100 years for your kid to get evaluated. Um, so it's very important that if your kid is like in that teeter-totter range, you really push for them before four and a half to call child fine. So, mm -hmm. sorry. So that's what happened with my second son. Cause he was like, I, by that time I knew a little bit better and he was having um, delays in language development, but he's not on the spectrum. So, but I took him there and because he had a brother, they put him in the program as well. Correct. So, uh, Just because you're at kind of higher risk and technically when you have a yeah. sick well, he was older and then he was child fine. Mm -hmm. I remember that. <laughs> Perfect. No, no, and it might've been a while from then, who knows. Um, but just so you know, you ring up child fine, right? They first do a screening. So they're looking like over the phone, like, Hey, what are some of the red flags you're seeing? Then they'll determine if you need an evaluation based on that evaluation. Then they will determine if you have eligibility or placement. And then the fourth step would be to program participation. So then they'll tell you from there, Hey, you know, um, Bodwin is under in your area. They have an opening. You can enroll your kid tomorrow. You want to go there? Okay. You now you cannot do this with child find FYI. What if you live in Coral Springs and you want to go to Bodwin? Too bad, so sad. Don't work like that. They work within where you live and what program is available as close as you live. And I get it. That's the fairest way to do it. It's not fair just because you want to request the school for you not to go to another one. There's designated schools that have these programs. Not every single elementary school has this program, by the way. There are a couple in the county that have them, and that's where you go. Now, after he's been in the program for a while, then he could use McKay to go to another school. That's after kindergarten, so that's good. We're gonna hit kind of that part of the presentation a little further down, so just kind of wait for me for the financial portion. So, child fine is just for the preschool kind of portion, or what's considered like services to kind of help get your child ready for kindergarten. Now, there are other transitions that you need to be very, very conscious of. When you enroll your child in school, you need to immediately, immediately as a parent, tell everybody on the team because that's gonna affect your therapeutic schedule, right? How many hours I can service your child, when OT takes place, when speech takes place. And a lot of times what we see, I saw that in the afternoon clinic, right? Hey, school takes a priority and all the therapies go on the back end. That never ends up good for anybody. This is a place where I will say that never, 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 never ends up good for anybody. Because, great, I always tell people, like, what if your kid is, like, super awesome, bright, like, and then they end up being Steve Jobs. Do you know Steve Jobs lost his company? Twice. 
had a kid he didn't speak to and didn't recognize until the end of his life. <laughs> By the way, didn't take his cancer medication and could have had to be cured of his cancer because he was, he had so many like social impairments. So what good is it if you have one and not the other? So I really kind of tell parents, take heed. Again, if it was my child, therapy comes before everything because therapy gives you the foundation of being able to thrive academically. But unfortunately, sometimes my words fall on deaf ears and it's just like, no, Pam, they really got to go to school. Like, you don't understand. This program's amazing. Everyone tells me about it. You don't know. Okay. And then ring around the rosy. And then a year later, we kind of come back to where we were. Um, it is very, very important that services are not frozen or seized because of something. So this happens the most, I feel like, to speech and OT right? As soon as a kid goes to school, the parent, because they don't understand what language services are or OT services are in a school setting, assume that they are getting speech and OT, medical speech and OT. And it is never that way. So I always make sure I'm like, if has this OT or the speech discharged you from care? No, then you still need to go to speech and OT. Period, end of story. Because what the school system is doing is basing their speech or motor skills based on their academic learning needs, not on their life needs, on their academic learning needs. And they have to do that in heat of how many other children. Yeah, and it's generally, they do, they do like 15 minutes. Exactly. Session. 15 minutes? Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, in a group <laughs> setting, in a group setting. <laughs> In a group. Yeah, like 15 uh, in, with two and 15 in a group setting. Like, and a lot of people don't have their own. I think they case. call that speech. I mean. But it's not called speech. It's called language-based services, right? right. But right. that's where they kind of get. And it's not the school's responsibility, and I will not place that, to provide medical grade services through the school. Some mm -hmm. states do that. Our state does not. We do not have the funding for that. Um, now. Excuse me, Tom. The, uh, yep. Oh, I just wanted to ask, because, right, if the parents, I feel like that is true, like, they kind of assume, like, language-based services, it's it's going to replace instead of help with school, but do they get explained that, that no. language-based services no. are not, they just tell them, like, oh, you're going to get this and this and this, no. and they just, like, okay, I'm just going to take it and run. No. And then yeah, we have to explain. Because the name is very similar to speech. It's extremely and similar. Yeah, and lazy minds, they think it's lazy getting the same services. And usually teacher use, I've never actually like heard teacher or like whatever school representative use the word language therapy. I always hear it speech therapy from yes. teachers, even I though it doesn't cause it. Because it's a speech language pathologist that has to give the services. So it's perfectly understandable to me why a parent would make that confusion. Because it's like saying, but, what do you mean I'm not going to the doctor, but a doctor is seeing me. That makes no sense. It does not make any sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Don't they have, I know that we have like, are we the only like healthcare service that has like an ethics to tell them like, hey, these are not the services that your child is gonna benefit from. Like they just tell them like, this is what you're gonna get. And they don't explain how the services work. But that's cool. But that's, that's cool. different. It's different. That's, yeah, it's very different. They're, they don't have a okay. medical obligation. Right, but are you talking about like speech and OT? Do they explain this or the transitions from part C to part B? Well, yeah, yeah, no. because if they're pausing, if they're pausing services and they're like, oh, I'm getting it at school, wouldn't they know that like, hey, school's not, school's not doing that. The school. Let me explain to you kind of what part C works like. Part, and this is why I like part C a lot more than part B. Part C, you're actually getting speech language pathology services from an SLP. You are getting medically grade SLPs from an, like if you get recommended from early steps, hey, your kid needs speech, you get speech therapy. If you need OT, you actually get OT. Problem is, it's like, the best way I can explain is like a puppy mill. There's just too many puppies to service for me to have time in the 30 minutes I'm supposed to be servicing your child to talk to you about this. So there is no, I don't know, there's a gap in the market there. I had another a therapist of mine who was a parent. I'm actually wanting for her to come on next week and teach you guys about kind of adult services. Um, lady had to learn everything from the ground up like me. So it wasn't like, there is no manual. There is no class I can teach you because if I'm sitting here and explaining this to you, this takes years and like time and time and time and time. Just like Maria the other day was like, 
well, I just need all the people you know in your head, like in a paper. I'm like, but it's not even just works like that. You have to develop a rapport with people. You're like, oh, I know this one over here. This one will remind me over here, over here. Okay, this is open. This is, it's just things that you end up learning, unfortunately, through the cause. And, but yeah, like a lot of people are like, why did no one explain this to me? Who has time to explain this to you? Okay. Unfortunately, well, no, because I feel saying that this is the way it is. Because I feel like if, if we're the only ones telling them that, they're like, oh, they're just, they just want to continue services. I feel like being yeah. such a consumer driven, right? Like people are like, oh, you just want me to do ABA because you're the one providing ABA. And you're the only one who's told me that it's not going to benefit him because they told me at the school that they're going to, I've had that conversation with somebody. Oh, and you know, not me myself, but like, that, then that's it. I'm, I'm rid of my ethical obligation. If I know and I'm making okay. the best, then I'm like, okay. I've learned people don't have to take my advice. I'm you. perfectly happy. Yeah. But I know I'm going to be right. And then when I'm right, it's really bad. Because then at that point, I'm making a decision that might be different than yours. Right? Mm -hmm. So I say this is the information. Like, I have a client that I'm super frustrated with that forever and ever and ever I've been telling them, hey, this child needs speech, this child needs OT, this child needs things that I can't give them. And the parent refuses to do it. And I have learned through time, and that's part of one of the vacations I took, let it go, let it go. Wow. Right? If you want to say, okay, I'm just letting you know, this is, this is my understanding of the school system. Okay. You, they told you they're going to give you speech. And I always say, make sure you ask your speech pathologist to give you a report and ask the school if they're going to do that. So I've also learned to combat it in my own way. Right? And so when you take a medical grade speech you know, report, and the school goes, no, we don't do that, then they'll have a better understanding of what they do. I think that um, Zoom, school through Zoom, is helping parents open their, their eyes. Yes. So now they're like, oh, is this a, is this? This is what school is, <laughs> yeah. Lots and lots, I believe that this is going to really revolutionize the world in terms of schooling. From all the way from like pre, like, you know, daycares all the way up to like higher ed learning. You imagine if your kid's at Harvard and you're paying $80,000 for them to get services in school. <laughs> Let me tell you something. I would not pay no eighty thousand dollars for my child to go to Harvard in my house. No, thank you. Like, I would not, no, thank you. So I think that that's gonna start changing things. Like, I have a parent who told me the other day. I'm like, oh no, I avoid the speech lady. He already has speech. He has real speech services. What am I doing? Like, you know, trying to do something on the screen. And then I even had another speech pathologist that completely violated. So the child was on Zoom. Bless you. Thank you. Thank you. The child was on Zoom and she asked a child if they're here for a language impairment or language services. That's a violation of FERPA. And she's asking a bunch of seven year olds that. What the hell are they going to know? What are their goals on the IEP? They don't know. So I've heard the craziest things, and not on the teacher side or the, you know, the therapy side. A lot of them have avoided giving because they can't service children. And depending on the parents, COVID is just kind of, I'm not judging anyone based on COVID, but I agree with Thelma. I think people are really understanding what school is now. Mm -hmm. For the good or the bad, or it's just they're, they're really getting it. So it's, it's going to be interesting in this season. So I always mm -hmm. want to kind of let people know who is eligible to kind of go to child fine. So now these are like the divine 13 that would qualify someone for eligibility and placement in child fine. Now, here's the issue. It's not just because your child has a label. And this is where people get confused. Just because your kid has autism or ADHD or it doesn't happen like this. Blind kids is different because you're blind. That's different. <laughs> Very medical, like clear cut thing. Um, and even still, because if your vision impairment does not affect your academic learning needs, then you are not eligible. And that is a very two different, so your child has to be found not just to be medically diagnosed, because they don't even care if they're medically diagnosed or not. They have to be found academically eligible so that this condition is impairing their academic learning needs. So we do have kids, for example, who the school says they don't have autism, they don't have autism, even though I don't know who the heck tells them they have the right to tell, you don't have the qualification to even diagnose. So- one, two, fine. 
But what they mean to say is they don't have an academic autism a spectrum disorder label that it would affect their learning needs, right? So three, four, and five-year-olds in Miami, Dade, or Palm Beach County are listed under the following classifications. I want to focus a little bit on this last one here, developmentally delayed, and explain to you guys what that even means. Um, but basically, if you have an intellectual disability, so if they've done an IQ test on you and you're considered developmentally delayed, um, which is kind of shaky because at seven years, uh, it's not until seven or beyond that your IQ is actually even set. Emotional behavioral disability, vision impairment, language impairment, speech impairment, orthopedically impaired. For example, you have a child with like a longer foot than another, a dual sensory impaired, ASD, specific learning disabled, deaf and hard of hearing. You need to be, meet those qualifications under what is considered an academic eligibility, which is similar to a medical disability, but it's not the same. Um, now, one of those needs to carry through for your child to have an IEP, except event developmentally delayed. Developmentally delayed only lasts till six years old. And Thelma, let me show you kind of what I've seen a lot of people do, especially advocates for, that sometimes has shot a lot of my parents in the foot later on with that. So when a kid is in child time and they can't really place what the heck is wrong with the kid, or maybe they don't have a actual autism diagnosis, the psychologist and the team at Child Find is a bit more apprehensive of putting an ASD label versus putting a developmentally delayed. Mind you, anyone who gets a developmentally delayed will usually almost always qualify for an evaluation at the time of six years old, that if they still have needs, they'll pick something else. Now, a lot of people pick developmentally delayed because let's say it's not ASD, it's just your kid has a slower learning rate. It gives them time to catch up, but they're still eligible for services. Um, it forces the hand of the county to have to reevaluate. There's two ways that this can screw you over when it comes to financial funding. One, it can't screw you over. It has seen it screw people over for Gardner and for McKay. Two, in continuing services after kindergarten, it can screw you over. Three, it will screw you over if you're trying to do a charter or a private school. Because many private schools that are dedicated for autism can only take a child that has an ASD label on their IEP. So it's not that you can't go, but you're going to kind of spend all of kindergarten waiting for the secondary label. Because a lot of things that the advocates used to say is, well, you really want developmentally delayed because then your child will never have that on their record that they had autism. Like school records are sealed. I don't even know why would it would matter for anything. Yeah. They're guarded under the same privacy as HIPAA. So I'm like, so why is that functional ever when? It's what? functional when your child is trying to gain eligibility to a private school. Because many private schools will not take a child that has ASD. They're not legally, and they're legally perfectly allowed to do that. They, um, like, I, I know a school that they will take them. Mm -hmm. on their special program yeah but not even if the kid is eligible to go to yeah university. and they have no difficulty learning they'll sometimes kind of put it so there is prejudice sometimes in having an asc label so i won't say that but i've kind of come to understand i can disclose or not disclose whatever the heck i want to a school period end of story your medical needs are your business so if I have a parent going there, I'd be like, why do you have to share the IP? You don't have to share it. <laughs> don't share the IP. Mm -hmm. And it, now, my, if it's like the wrong setting, I would try to divert them from that. But internationally, there's a lot of prejudice on what ASD is. And I may have a perfectly like capable child who's high functioning. And because the school sees that, they're like, no, no, no. Because they have an idea of what ASD is, but they don't know my kid. People are so, not. Yeah, so I've dealt with this a lot more internationally than I have in the U.S. Much, 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 much more. So yeah. I, for those families, it's a very different thing versus kind of what happens here. I just generally steer my parents to if your child has an ASD diagnosis, put the ASD on their IEP. By the way, this is a lie that advocates tell you. I don't know why they tell you. You can remove the label if they don't meet the academic eligibility of ASD. I have seen labels removed plenty of times. Pre and post fourth grade. 
I, I don't know <laughs> where we invented that. It could have been the case that it wasn't that easy before. But I find that if your child's actually making progress, the first people that want to push them through would be the school itself. Because they have to make extra resources and use resources that may not be a good idea for your kid when there's other kids that need that. Now, here's the thing. What if I delay child sign? Okay. It's important to know that the aim of child sign is to serve your child's educational needs. So I'm always very clear with parents about that. Um, you know, ABA is very different because we are there to service your child's global needs, right? So we want positive and meaningful changes in all areas of their life, not just education, but in daily living and social skills in their ability to be a human being in their ability to thrive in life. Now, I always tell the parent, always, always, always go for the meeting for eligibility and placement. That doesn't mean you have to take it. You could just go and have your kid evaluated and you could just, okay, you decide not to, you have that right forever. Now, what I would recommend more times than not, and I will say I have recommended that, not for my benefit, is that I always tell the parent, if you put your kid in child fine, so let's say your child is found eligible to go to a school nine to 12, Monday through Friday. Let's calculate how many hours that is. That's 15 hours a week. Are you telling me you want to spend 15 hours a week when you can have comprehensive ABA? You wanna give up 15 hours of therapy to go to school at three years old? Tell me, what, what makes more of a difference? You wanna do intensive 15 hours every week or you wanna do school 15 hours a week? And I, I make the parent think about it in time mode. I mean, basically works till like six years old until they, they need to be enrolled at school, right? Right. So in the state of Florida, you don't have to enroll your child in kindergarten until the age of six years old. And it's very important um, like to give them that information and all the information because like I've been there and I didn't have any. I didn't even know what ABA was. Like I, I thought I was receiving ABA when I was, when yeah. it was on early steps, yeah. you know, so it's... Uh, and it sucks, and I'm sorry for that, because a lot of times people aren't really well trained in that. Like, I think that it's not that BCBAs, like, don't want to give that information. Most of them don't know that information. Mm -hmm. That's the reason, right? Like, <laughs> so you can't give information you don't know about. But I think it's very important because there is a very big push for school because everyone assumes school is great, like, you're going to be around kids. Like, and I'm not devaluing the value of school, but I would never, ever, 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 ever say that school will do what intensive behavioral therapy will do. Mm -hmm. it, I mean, it's evidence-based. So it's like, how are you going to sit there and go against science for me and tell me that enrolling your kid in school is better than... And even like, you know, social skills, I've heard, like, thrown down. Like, this is not our, like, this has to be done outside. Our obligation is this education, not the social skills. You know, so there you go. And I always say, like, education can always, and I, I always tell the parent, like, you don't need to get ABA if your kid just needs, like, extra tutoring. Trust me, a tutor is way cheaper than a BCBA. Very cheap. Mm -hmm. But if your kid, even if they're the smartest person in, in terms of cognitively in the classroom, if they can't sit down and follow directions, you better believe your kid's not going to be in a mainstream classroom. No, they will not. In order to even shine with that cognition. So you, mm -hmm. I always want to put a child in an area where they can thrive. And like, this is where I find like Helen Keller's story really compelling. So I don't know if you guys ever, do you know a little bit about Helen Keller? Yeah. So Helen Keller was born deaf and blind and she had this really awesome teacher named Ann Sullivan. And like when Ann Sullivan got her, she was like completely untamable. She was like swiping things off of people's plates. Like, and she had to almost train her behaviorally before she got her to learn. And if she didn't do that, then Helen Keller wouldn't have been the person that she is today. So that's why it's important to work on the foundation, especially social emotional needs, like working on daily living needs, because that sets you up for success in the future. And if your kid just needs extra tutoring to learn two plus two, it doesn't really matter. You can survive that. And so how would this transition happen? So then this is kind of what I try to have everybody understand. So 
Child find goes through screening, evaluation, eligibility, and placement. I always advocate for the parent to do this and then kind of consider, do I con you know, continue my child in intensive therapy or do I send them to school? Mind you, there are people, because I worked pre-2009, that didn't have coverage, for example, for, for care, aren't having ABA. Of course, school is a good option. I'd rather your kid be doing 15 hours in school than being 15 hours twiddling his fingers. I'm not saying there's not a place and time for that. Or if your child doesn't really have, like, that they need more socialization because they're an only child and that's the only socialization they'll get. Maybe that's a good idea. So there are times where I feel like it is good to enroll your kid. Um, but there's also different options that ABA could provide you. Maybe we can recommend you to a daycare program or a preschool program that would allow a shadow to come in that could help us work more intensely with your child to prepare them for a mainstream classroom. So that's also something I've done. Um, so r recommending that the parent, this is really interesting. People don't do this before an IEP. Every year, I usually recommend a parent to come back and have someone from the county or the school explain procedural safeguards. And guess what you're going to find out? None of the ESC directors know what the procedural safeguards say. And I ask them because they say, hey, did you get your procedure? They have to do this at the beginning of every meeting. Did you get your procedural safeguards? And then everyone goes, yeah, I did, because they send you the packet. I've never seen a school not send the packet. Um, but then I always tell the parent, ask them, so what, what is it, what are my, because you have the right to say, what are my rights? And of that, every time someone explains it, I learn something new. By the way, if you ever have an attorney at an IEP, you need to let the school know within 48 business hours before, because then they have to have their own attorney there. So you can't just bring an attorney. You have the right to bring whoever you want. You have the right to have the meeting rescheduled. You have, I mean, I learn all these new and interesting things when people have to explain it out loud. That's when I feel a parent is more attentive to what their rights are and how to best advocate for their child. So obviously they're not gonna go through the 64 pages, but most of them will go through like the big global things and you'll learn a couple of different things. Um, Cause the lawyer thing came up because someone accidentally thought I was an attorney and I said, no, 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 not an attorney. They're like, oh, okay, because we we're going to have to reschedule the meeting. And I said, what do you mean you have to reschedule the meeting? And then they said, well, if you have an attorney, then the school is allowed an attorney. Because this is a legally binding document. And I said, oh, that's interesting. So understanding that an IEP is a uh, recommendation on a placement is valid for a year. After a year, the parent can accept the previous uh, placement or they can petition a new evaluation. Generally, new evaluations are done every three years they have they're not done before then unless something like dramatic has changed um i would say you also kind of meet with the parent to understand you have to be very on top of having the iep and having that current so let's say you decide not to put your kid in child fine their last iep will probably be at three years old and the time you enroll them in school they might be five this is a completely different child at the age of three to five so we need to get that ball rolling as quickly as possible right so i just put some common questions here and guys i can resend the powerpoint via email it's no problem um does their placement automatically determine the program no you can have children for example with an asd label who are put in a mainstream classroom that has nothing to do with their placement in terms of mainstream or not it's just the eligibility criteria that they need to meet to get um services or an IEP completed. That's kind of the short version of that. Okay. Um, do, 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 do. This is just kind of understanding and really writing out what an IEP is. So it is the child's Bible. That's the best way I've heard it. <laughs> it's true. It is a legally binding document. It is your kid's guide to who they are. So a lot of times McKay, um, Gardner, different private schools will read an IEP. Another kind of provider will read an IEP. It's very important for it to be current and a good description of what your child is working on in academic settings. Um, in terms of charter schools, many charter schools have the ability to reject a child with an IEP. That's the way it is. There are some specifically designated charter schools. So I put some below like SFAX, Palm Beach School for Autism, but for the most part, now they're gonna open up a new one in Pembroke Pines, FSU is. I don't know when they open in real life for a real person, I'll, I'll give you guys more information. I don't know what's going on with the status of that school. Um, but 
charter schools have kind of a bit more flexibility, but they also don't have the obligation to service children with special needs. So I tell parents to be very cognizant of that when you're choosing a charter school, for example. Um, the academic transition to a private school is, is very different. It depends on the school. So I really kind of tell parents to take heed of what school, the higher sticker price doesn't always necessarily mean the best placement. So you really want to get a good idea of what are the supports within that school? What are the policies? Um, are they going to require a shadow? Do you think that that's going to be an RBT? Like what are the cost and benefit analysis per school? But I would say that's very individualized. So I'm not going to sit there and kind of give an analysis of public school A unless I have a good understanding of like what the actual private school is because it just depends. Um, um, have you heard of APA, American Preparatory Academy, is a private school for special needs? No. It's in Davie and like one of my previous clients just started this as a middle school and I was just like, oh, I didn't know this. So I just wanted to. No, I had no idea. So if they give you some more information, I'd love to know. Okay. But then you also have a lot of religious schools, for example, like Poznan. I'll tell you that. Um, Poznan School is a um, Jewish private school that is a little bit out of my house, like Cooper City. Um, they have a program called Poznan Plus that services children, you know, with special needs. But they generally tend to be kind of higher functioning. Um, Calvary, a Christian school academy, also has a special needs program that they service from kindergarten all the way up to 12th grade. So these also go changing and evolving as like time goes on. So I'm very curious kind of how things will evolve post COVID. So if anyone has any extra schools, be happy to share. We will end up making this master list. I just need to get through this season, friends. We will, I promise. <laughs> I've heard uh, Calvary is really good. Um, I've heard very good things about Calvary. Yeah. Um, and from a colleague of mine, she also has a child on the spectrum who's phenom like doing phenomenal in high school there. So. I've only, and she actually is in the field. So I tend to trust a parent like that versus kind of any other, not to say that any other run of the mill parent's opinion doesn't matter, but it's different when you've worked with schools and you do this for a living because you have an understanding that's quite different and what you're looking for in a school versus like, I just want a kid that like a school that takes my kid and loves my kid. Like I'm not really, I don't judge that on the validity of how well a school can service a child on the spectrum. Um, so just to have an understanding, because of the IDEA Act, all public schools have to provide children a free and appropriate education. That is a guarantee the federal government makes, and that's throughout the entire United States. Um, the way this is done in Florida is through child fine, right? So once a child fine recommends a placement, that trampoline, it'll send you where to get those needs met in a different school. Um, they have to always allow the collaboration of a parent um, and bend to the parent's schedule. So let's say like, hey, I can only meet, I had a parent that one was in, in Dubai and the other one was here. And we had the strangest meeting time in order for us to all be together, which was great. I really appreciated that the school bent over backwards for that. Um, dad really wanted to be present, but it wasn't always the easiest when you're working with a 12 hour time. Um, you can have a lot of different types of accommodations also included, not just IEP goals. So kind of testing accommodations, um, smaller ratios, if your child needs to have um, things read out loud to them. I mean, there's all different types of kind of accommodations also included within an IEP. Um, whether your kid needs a seat belt or a harness or a seat vest in a, in a public school bus to go to a field trip, that's also discussed in an IEP. Um, and the public school system will not allow private shadows to assist throughout the learning day. This presentation was made right before the court ruling of RBT. So now Miami and, and, and Broward and all the state of Florida has to allow RBTs in the school system. However, I always tell the parent, this cannot be a cyclical thing. The insurance company with due reason, right? This is where I feel like I'm, I'm a BCBA all alone on the island here because I'm the only person that you're probably here say this. In my opinion, the, the insurance companies are correct. They should not have to have an RBT in school so that the school can meet the child's needs. Right? Most analysts are like, no, we want the RBT there. You know, the kid needs this during their schooling. Like, it doesn't matter when they need it. But I also think, why is the setting not providing that? 
And why does ABA have to do that? Awesome. Pam, they allow now, but they fight as they can not to have anyone from outside there. It depends. Right. Like, you're going to go through a lot of paperwork hoops, uh, but I've seen that kind of facilitate in the last year or so. Um, I mean, you have to fill out more papers, and I, I don't even know. I don't even think the IRS fills out that many papers for somebody to go inside. Like, you have to re-get your background check and do this, and then have this badge. and blah, blah, blah. I mean, it's just a shenanigan. But I think unless it's to support the teacher to then pull out and provide services elsewhere, I have no idea why we want RBTs in the classroom. Because what ends up happening is the teacher relegates her teaching responsibilities to you. Hands down, I've seen that 98% of the time. It's not really the model that I would want when I'm going into shadow, which is, hey, I want to train you. Do you have a few minutes? Like the kid at the Montessori school. I knew he was in a good placement. I just needed to teach the teachers how to deal with him. And that's why I was able to have an RBT there. I first started at, you know, 15 hours, then went to 10 hours. And then at the end, she's like, we don't really need anybody. We can handle him. Like, please stop coming. Which is the most beautiful thing you can ever hear as a BCBA. Um, but it was a very structured model with a plan of come in and come out versus, hey, we just need an RBT to sit with him because he doesn't sit still. And there's four other kids that are self-injuring in the classroom and I really need your help. No. You basically becomes teacher assistant. They're just extra hands. You're just extra a baby scooter. Exactly. So your recommendation here would be if the kid needs to train the para, right? Train the if a child needs an RBT, they're not in the right setting, period. They are not in the right setting, whatever that may be, they're not in the right setting. Which means they are not in the right school, they may not be in the right classroom, they might not be in the right program in general. A restaurant. Mm -hmm. It could be that, you know, your child maybe needs more intensive therapy services. So I don't care if your kid's 12, if they can't sit down and learn, like maybe you should homeschool them for a season. That might be better. Uh, what if the child can't see it? Mm -hmm. But it's not paying attention, like cannot do anything else, like the learning is not there. But why, right? Like then I would want to kind of figure out why. Is there an intellectual disability there? Is there a communication deficit? Like what is going on that the, the kid is not learning? Something's going on in the setting that I, I think an RBT is like putting an Advil to somebody who has like a bleeding, gushing wound. I don't understand what it's going to do for it. Like I want to figure out why this kid is bleeding, not here's an Advil for pain. Because I, I mean, Maria can attest to it. She's been an RBT in a school. She was the babysitter for the child. She was the teaching instructor. She got the te and then the te they're very strict about you only deal with your kid, right? Which I agree with. I'm not saying is, but what if one kid is affecting another? I've done that, but in private school, not never in public school. So what's happened many times is one kid's behavior may set off another's. So how can I fix that kid's behavior without fixing the other one? Or the teacher's like, I don't have time to do this. Well, that's not my, again, that is not my problem. Those are not my monkeys. This is not my circus. That's my sister's favorite phrase. They <laughs> have limited understanding what's our role in, uh, in this situation. So like they, they don't understand like our role exactly. So teacher like literally just like, what are you doing here? So she didn't understand like what's going on. Even though like it was explained to her a lot of times <laughs> as my role, they just don't comprehend. I don't know if it's correct word. Yeah, yeah. That, I would yeah, they don't comprehend what it is that we do or what we're supposed to do. Because it is a little bit odd to understand kind of what ABA is. And the other big thing is then what parents and then Jess can kind of testify to this is then what parents try to do is get the school to hire a paraprofessional simply for their child. That's not gonna happen. Unless and for the chat, likelihood of happening happen. is like zero to nil. You may get yeah. extra support during some times. It literally has only happened to me twice, and those cases needed it. Like needed it, but they are like so the exception to the exception to the exception that that's why the school said, okay. Now I have had people sue the school, have advocates, and they get a full time paraprofessional for your child. What is the point of that? Is your kid learning? They don't know, and most of the time these pair, which I'm facing that now, um, most of the time the pair, they're not trained. Yeah. They're not trained and, you know. So then you come back to the same problem. Because you're putting yeah. your child with somebody who's not trained to deal with them 
in order to have them survive what? Then again, comes back to the same need. You're not in the right setting. Yes, exactly. The parents, the parents like, they want the kid in the mainstream classroom. It's like that is it their prize or something. Yeah. And you see that he's not ready. <laughs> right. You have to learn. I'm not a parent yet. So I'm going to give you the advice that the other parent that I want to come on next week gave me. And this was the most insightful thing I have learned last year as an analyst. As a parent, you have to accept two realities. Number one, your child has, your child has autism. Mm. And number two, that it's forever. Mm. Number two is much harder than number one. And until you've accepted number two, you will not be the best advocate for your child. I, it used to be in the past that number one was the issue, right? Internationally for me, sometimes number one's the issue. Number two is a ha much harder feat because you have to let go of the expectation of this is who I want my kid to be. This is who I wanted their really, you And I, as a human being, can't even speak to that. I only have sympathy because that's all I can have. But I try to get the parent in whatever way I can to accept number two. Because until you accept number two, I can't really help you with your kid, especially as your child starts to age. Because then you're like, I just want them to be in a normal class with other kids. But what does that mean? It really means at the bottom, I want my kid to be normal. But yeah. mommy, that's not what the vote brought. Then you have an advocate telling them, oh, look, if he doesn't transition now, he's never going to get into a college because colleges will not accept that kind of degree. And that's not it at all. That's not it at all. Yeah. But I'm just an RBT for now. I have to be. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, no. It's good to learn, right? Like you learn good things from advocates and you learn not so great things about advocates. Um, I've learned um, to be more attentive at child find IEPs about listing speech evaluations versus language based because it technically doesn't entitle a child to speech or language based services after kindergarten. So I've learned that. I've learned lots of good things, but when it comes to a lot of people, because it's hard to sit down to a family and tell them, hey, this is really your, where your kid is at. And the likelihood of your kid being there is very high. That is a very difficult conversation to have across the table with somebody. I promise you, it's heartbreaking, it's difficult, right? The first thing most parents wanna know is what is the prognosis of my child? How are they gonna get better? And again, I always tell them, before your kid has even started therapy, they don't even have a level. I don't even know who they are. We don't have this conversation. But a year and a half, two years into therapy, you have a good idea if a child's very impacted. So I think the best thing for us to do is to inform the parents so they can best prepare themselves with the resources that they need. That's not to say your kid won't talk. I don't know. Like God works miracles. And I believe that every single day. Like I'm a person of faith and I really believe that who's to know what they really know and maybe can express. I really do understand that. Like I've had kids that I know that they understand me, right? I made a mistake on Friday. It's funny Maria was there and I was like, <laughs> I apologize to the child. I was like, I'm sorry. I pushed you too hard, puppy. I'm sorry. Like I messed up. It's okay. But I make mistakes, right? Like I try to also tell them, I model what I want to see. Right? If I make a mistake, I apologize. Just because I, I believe I accept it. And he accepted my apology because he understood. Because I was like, I'm sorry, buddy. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Like, I really messed up. I didn't mean to frighten you. Um, but I think it's really important for us to have compassion in that sense. Like, understand what you're telling somebody is the hardest news you're going to hear of their life. It is. And it's not easy. But if I don't have that tough conversation with you, then you're just going to keep pushing this mainstream thing. And you know, I had a family who, like, I loved the way another analyst said it when we were kind of speaking across the screen. And in my experience, I have not seen a child who shows no verbal kind of approximation or kind of, like no verbal, out, no vocal output begin to speak. Like, if I don't hear vocal output past seven, it generally doesn't come, right? That's tough, but it, that's been my experience. Right? And that's what I always tell the family. Maybe your child will be the exception. I have had one case where someone was completely nonverbal and I was talking to their parent. They turned around and in complete perfect like sentence said, please do not talk to me. Uh, 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 what is it? No. Please do not talk about me. I do not like that. 
and the hairs on the back of everything like stood up and like I just it like left me cold a child who never spoke spoke in a full sentence and that was the day that I was like okay these kids like completely understand and maybe it's selective mutism maybe I don't know but I don't want to give the parent false expectation because I, I told them I've seen about mm, anywhere between 200 and 300 cases in my career mm -hmm. I just haven't witnessed it. right that doesn't mean that it won't happen but I have not witnessed I'll usually see some sort of vocal input in the child when they begin speaking. But globally, most children with autism, like between 70 and 80% do end up speaking. Um, what that means is different though, right? Like only 25% fall in the higher functioning category. And a lot of times that's what the parent wants, right? They're like, oh, my kid can be the higher functioning one. They could be. That's great. Like, but there's lots of things that you have in your favor, like, right? Early intervention is really good. Getting the right team in place, learning how to kind of implement you got to put your cards in the favor, but then there's another part that's just, it's God's, right? Because that means that also 25% of our population is very severely impacted. That no matter what kind of therapy, they're just, their learning ability is different. It's impacted by another intellectual disability or possibly another communication or psychological issue. But that doesn't mean that those kids don't deserve the same amount of effort, love, respect, and dignity that every other kid deserves. And that's what I try to tell them. Like, it's not like, and when a parent comes to that realization, your whole entire therapeutic program looks beautiful because you're really allowed to flexibly program for the kids' needs. But it's after number two happens, not before. And it's, it's tough. It's just tough. All right, guys, so here we go. So some private schools, this is just kind of giving you an overview. Some of them will allow shadows, some of them won't, depends on school. Um, most of them is, most private schools, their aim is to kind of integrate or in, include. I haven't seen too many clusters and the cluster ones I can name like on the fingers of my hand, right? Like Atlantis Academy, um, SFAX, Palm Beach School for Autism. So th there's other schools dedicated for that, but you generally know where they are and who they are. Um, now. Let's kind of get to the crux of the, wow, it's 820. Okay, let's vote. We can pick up on some of this next week because this is gonna be kind of a detailed talk about money and kind of how to apply and do everything. So let me stop sharing screen. I would like to get Lisette on for this conversation because I also want her to speak to what's called MedWaiver and Medicaid and disability, which is a field that we should be knowledgeable about, but I don't find many people who are. Um, we can do the whole money talk next week or I can keep kind of going. I think it's a good kind of place to stop, especially since I've talked to myself to death in 100, no, 80 minutes. Feel? All right, cool. Um, does anybody have any questions in regards to what we have learned today? Shoot scenarios if you want, how to have a good and comfortable conversation. I'm all ears. Very good and informative. As usual. <laughs> <laughs> no questions? We kind of, we, we did a good job like asking throughout, so I feel like that was good. Um, I would just say do the, you know, try to grab as many opportunities as you can to hear IEPs, to read IEPs, right? Like even if you have clients and you're an RBT, just ask the parent, Hey, do you mind sharing your IEP with me? Or maybe ask the BCBA first. So you don't step on toes. Yeah. Don't do that. Um, <laughs> they'd be happy to give it to you. So you can just get a fluency of what it is and then they can better guide you. Yep. Go ahead, Jesse. I think I can't hear you, mama. Oh my God, she was having the same problem I'm having. Oh. Okay, mute yourself and mute, unmute yourself and see if that works. No. no. If you want, type it in. Type it in. Type it in. Okay. Um, but I would say try to read as many as you can, and then you can get a good general understanding. I literally just went through this with a parent the they're like no we decided this he's getting this i'm like you have no accommodations page on your iep and they're like oh but like i'm like no it's not there 
Like, it's not there. I have the whole draft. I don't know what you're talking about. So also making parents very aware, like, they're different sections, and the whole section has to be in the IEP, right? So whatever they're getting, sometimes that's not it. All right. Is there a difference between accommodations and supports and modifications? I sat in an IEP meeting, and the school was trying to argue that the client did not need an IEP, only accommodations under a 504. Yes, a 504 is different than an IEP. An IEP needs to have an eligibility criterion. So for example, ADHD does not qualify as a criterion for a child to have an IEP. It's not under the divine 13 that I showed you, right? Well, it falls uh, under OHI. Yeah, uh, sorry? It falls under OHI. OHI. Other health and care. Yeah. yeah. Um, but that wouldn't necessarily qualify them for an IEP or would it just? They'd have to show an academic need. Okay, so that's, the, that's academic... the biggest difference. Yeah, so then I would say um, they had an IEP in place. So the only way that I would say that the school is more than likely legally trying to do that is to take them off is to probably not, they might be trying to mainstream that child. Was the kid mainstreamed or no? They were mainstreamed. Okay, it could be that he's not meeting academic, I'm sorry, uh, yep, academic eligibility for an IEP. So it may be a good thing, right? Like, um, we were a full shadow though. Yeah, does that mean you probably were in a good placement? Right? What if, what if parents um, say, okay, I'll pay for the therapist to be there the whole day? Uh, and like, that's what they want and that's what they want. Um, but you know that's not the best for the kids. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so. But I would always tell them, right? Like, unless you have Bill Gates money, usually the money argument works, right? Because <laughs> I mean, I have had parents with Bill Gates money. I've had parents who are very, very, very wealthy, right? That they could pay like a school, they found a school that's how much money they have. Um, I would try to understand why the parent has a necessity for a child to be in that specific school in a, that specific setting. Mm -hmm. And see if I can replicate a better setting for what their needs are. Now, I'll give you an example of what happened to me internationally. Internationally, especially in Latin America, your ability to gain employment and stay in a social class starts in schooling. So people want their children to be in a specific school, and you're in the same school, K through 12, by the way. You need to be in that school in order to gain access to that social strata. That argument I understand. See, but if I didn't ask, I wouldn't have understood that. And even still, I said, well, what if it comes at the cost of your child's educational and medical needs? Are you willing to do that, right? So then I kind of tell the parent, like, let's say they want someone there, they can pay them there. Well, just be aware the insurance is not going to indefinitely approve this forever. This can't be a forever strategy, one. So let's say money was no object, right? I'm not talking about money. This isn't going to be something the insurance is going to approve forever, just so you're aware. Two, to what benefit are you going to have that? And is that going to come to a cost for the child's academic and medical needs? And usually the answer to that is yes. So then you may have a problem that is more severe in two years versus not. Because little people, little problems, right? Old people say that all the time. Big people, big problems. Mm -hmm. And so I think usually I'm able to kind of convince a parent because I think that they at least trust my judgment enough to kind of see down the road. I also try to pair parents with people who are older so they can understand. Right, because when you're two and three and you only have friends that the parents are all two and three, you don't see what's coming. Which is why I'm like, hey, you know, you guys have two and three year olds. I have somebody who has an eight and nine year old. Why don't you pair up with them? Because then you see what eight and nine looks like. And eight and nine looks very different than two and three. Right? Things that like <laughs> you tolerate at two and three, you don't tolerate at eight and nine. I mean, I was even laughing with Katie, like mine are older at the afternoon clinic versus the day clinic ones. Like you see the day clinic parents because they're really young, like circling the building, getting anxious, like, oh my God, I'm leaving my kid. Who am I leaving him with? Mine, they're like, here, take them, take them. Right. I'm going to mom. Like, I don't know. As long as they're alive at three o'clock, like, I don't care. Six o'clock, I'm good. And that doesn't mean that they don't love their kids, but they've learned to trust that, like, we're not going to kill them. Like, they're fine. Yeah. Or, like, if one of them hits the other one, they're like, yeah, he probably deserved it. It's okay. 
<laughs> right? Like in a funny <laughs> way, like, oh, my kid got hit, he probably deserved it. Don't worry. That's Actually, not you have more than one. Because when you have only one, it's yours. <laughs> yeah. When you have more than one, it's like... Yeah. But you tend to ease up as usually children age. They kind of get used to this. But it's sort of hilarious. Like, I, I mean, even when I call them and they're like, you know, Johnny was having a behavior and Bobby was next to him and Bobby was an unfortunate recipient. Or we don't use the child's name, right? To save him. And they're like, it's okay. <laughs> they'll live another day. There's no bleeding, nothing broken. Okay, they'll live another day. So... Um, I think that is interesting to kind of consider, like, why did the school try to advocate for a 504? Could be for a specific, um, now, a lot of parents will try to keep a 9 p in place for funding, and you'll see that. It has nothing to do with their child's academic needs, it's funding. But if funding is necessary, I understand that argument. Right? I'll keep a 9 p in place forever if they give me more money. Yeah, I will. So... But if, if it's really just for the academic needs of the child, then I think maybe a 504 may have been more appropriate. So don't always assume, by the way, that the school's wrong. Sometimes the school is right. And the parent doesn't want to accept what the school is saying. Because I have encountered that too. The kind of what you're saying, Thelma. Right, that the school is knowing where to advocate and place this child, but they're just, the parent is unwilling. They want, for, I, I don't understand. <laughs> they want him the mainstream. But with the person that all the time. <laughs> yeah. Doesn't but make that, any sense. Yeah. But because they assume if your child is around other normal kids, they'll be normal. Right. Right? That's yeah. the assumption. Right? Like, oh, they'll pick up normal behaviors and they won't be so autistic. But then the hard reality a lot of times that they accept is those normal kids and those normal parents don't want to be around your child. And that's a really hard pill to swallow. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's hard too when, because I see it in my own school um, with a child that never received, received intermittent ABA throughout her life, wrong placement, mom didn't want to listen. Little person, little problems. Big person, big problems. Huge. Huge. So it's hard. And then you can only deal with what you have at the time, right? Like, so if I get a 12 year old that's never gotten services and I'm dealing with like World War III, then I have to just kind of mitigate my circumstances. But my goal in also helping people understand, work with and expose them to adults is so that they understand when they're little what they're supposed to do. So I'm very insistent that your child learn to wait, learn to sit, learn to follow instructions, learn to accept no before they're older. Because when you can't do that, sure. when you're older, I have to work on basically making sure that you don't kill people and, and yourself and that you're not a danger. Because if you don't accept those four big things, like you're gonna be a problem. And parents may still accept that, but no one else will. <laughs> and, but it will get to a point where parents cannot accept it. Yeah. And that's the other thing too, like, that's why I want Lissa on because she works with adults. Like what happens when you age as a parent and you physically cannot take your child anymore because you're, you're dealing with a grown man. Yeah. It's hard and it's different. But. Alrighty guys. Well, oh, I just wanted to ask one really quick question now that I, now that we're going farther down the, what are the different, what is the difference like, is there a difference in the way an IEP and a 504 look like? Because if, they, if it's just eligibility, if it's just eligibility for like academics, that really so makes them different. Like, basically, what? a 504 doesn't have goals. Where, where a, five, okay. a 504 is medically, you have to show a medical necessity. So you're going to have okay. that ADHD. You're going to have some type, maybe you have a broken arm. It could be temporary. Where in IEPs, because you have an academic need and you've shown, you've shown for a period of time that you've had that need. And within that IEP, you're going to have do different domains. You're going to have an academic domain, a behavioral, independent functioning. Independent functioning. You're going to have an, a communication section. And within all those sections, you don't have to have display a need in all those sections. 
but you will have goals, you'll have strengths and deficits within those domains. And within those domains, you write goals based on the deficits of each of those domains. Where a 504 does not have that. A 504 basically is, yes, I have a medical, I have a medical diagnosis, and I, have, I need accommodations. I need accommodations, I need extra time, I need small group, I may need my questions read to me, I may need um, assignments broken down, things like that. That's, that's the biggest difference. That's homework. So you're, it's basically like the IEP is like what the child needs to, like there's a goal that the child needs to meet. And then the, the 504 is basically like, these are what you're gonna provide for them yeah okay for testing for classroom those accommodations will be for the classroom and on state asset state assessments some teachers will even use like goals from the vb map like for the iep so we have yeah. oh by the way every iep will have an accommodation so this is kind of the difference every iep has a 504 section an accommodation section but not every 504 has every single 504 does not have a goals that was really good, Jess. There you go. Oh, that, that, no, that was doing, really good. Been doing it long. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> been doing Skinner it long. Skinner for Jess. Well, I don't know how long Skinner's will be around, but whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to leave. <laughs> I'm trying to stay no more. <laughs> it's really good. Thank you. That was like perfect. Like that's exactly. Now I know. Then exactly normally with the 504, you you. I mean, I've never seen it, and I'm not going to say never, because I've never seen it, but I'm in an elementary school. I've never seen goals. No, I haven't, an, I haven't either. I haven't seen that. And that's the biggest difference. If, if a school were to ever tell you, no, this child, I see a lot of parents that will come in and be like, no, my child needs an IEP, yet they're making C's. C's are average. They're average grades. They're not that's failing. Cool. Normally, when you have a child with an IEP, you're going to see D's. Uh, you're going to see D's, F's, two years behind. You're going to see a lot of a very big academic gap. But okay, for D's, so, those are kids that got yeah missing through the cracks, right? Yes. What happened? Yes. Because they're probably exactly those are the kids that yeah. Yeah, and those are the, those are the kids also like teachers may not pick up on those things. Mm -hmm. You know, they, those could be the teachers that they let go of the behaviors just to keep the peace, keep the flow of the classroom going. And so like, you see that a lot too, unless they come in with private evaluations, but even then it's going to take a while. It's not going to be immediate. Oh. All right. Perfect. Thank you. That was so awesome. Yeah. That was like perfectly explained. I appreciate it. <laughs> no, no I thought I was like walking into this, like I have no idea what any of this sounds like. It's just like letters and numbers. But, yeah, and basically yeah. it's like that. It's like a new Bible system you have to learn. Like, what is ASD? AAC? Not AAC. <laughs> I mean, I was it's funny. I was doing that with the lady from school, and then she was doing it with me. So I was like, what's this? BP and 504? And it's like, you, it's like you have to learn a new Star Wars language. But it's good for you guys to learn mm -hmm. it because it's part of our, right? ABA has Star Wars language. They have like Marvel language. So it's good to be well informed in at least the basics. Right. And then don't be afraid to ask questions because sometimes, especially in the beginning, I was like, what is that? Huh? <laughs> and I'm like, can you explain it? And then the parents looking at me like, thank you, because no one had the courage because a lot of times yeah. the assumes the parent knows what they're saying. Like the freaking yeah. <laughs> like, I'll never forget the first time I heard the word. What was it? Um, I think it was 504. I was like, what the heck's a 504? Um, and I was like, oh, okay. Or there's like sometimes initials within things. AAC, I heard for the very first time in an ITS meeting. I was like, huh? And then someone's like, oh, it stands for Pragmatic and Alternative Communication Method. Oh, okay. So ask, right? Don't be afraid because more than likely, you're just going to be the brave one that asks because nobody else knows either. And I think this lady made, I think she was a mom. She made like IEP terms, like a dictionary. Let me see if I find it. Hold on, let me Google it. <laughs> it was brilliant. I was like, this is amazing. So is there 
is there like certain is there like a limit to what to what an IEP can or a 504 can have and then a limit to what like an IEP can have um, it just has to meet their an IEP can have whatever it needs because it's an individualized plan. So yeah. I, that's a self-defeating okay. definition of an IEP. A 504 yeah. generally sticks to like certain scripts of accommodations. So like giving time and a half for tests or two times or like modifying test times, uh, work settings, services, um, things like that. Perfect. But by definition, an IEP cannot be, it just depends on the child. Mm -hmm. And it has to meet their like academic needs. Like they have to be able to like meet a certain criteria. Yeah. With the depending IEP. Depending on the okay. program, yeah. Mm -hmm. So and depending our, our, on standards or not on standards too. Which is another. Mm -hmm. Say that again, Tema. I was gonna ask about IPs. Can they ever end it? Like school? No. All right. It would really have to be more of a parent-led process. I've seen that with a parent-led process. Usually what I've seen is an IEP turns into a 504. And then the 504 usually should stay in place. Usually. At the older level. It's not cool. I, I hate IP meetings. I hate them. It depends. Sometimes I like them, sometimes I don't. Lately, I have been going, I had a really nice one on Thursday. I felt like that was a good one. Um, I like the teacher a lot. I think he did a really good job of surmising and like really hitting the nail on the head. Like, but that was like a miracle IP for me. I was like, oh, this is nice. I, I, love so many bad ones. <laughs> I love my teachers. I, I'm not the biggest fan of the IP lady. Yeah. <laughs> so but the good thing is you only have to tolerate her every once. <laughs> yeah. And I come prepared. She's like. <laughs> yeah. But you're right. It's your job. Like, and now I have parents so well trained. Like, they give me the draft beforehand. They know. Like, <laughs> like okay. I got it, Pam. Here we go. And I always tell them I'm a lot cheaper than another <laughs> But mind you, sometimes what you pay for in an advocate is connections. Yeah. Not really for their services, you pay for connections. So if yeah, you're telling you to have things done quicker, sometimes it is worth paying for. By the end of the day, mm -hmm. they know everyone in school. Oh, I've been that school many times. They have a report and it's like, oh. But that's why I love the section of the ethics code called conflicts of interest, right? Like, mm -hmm. we have to abide to stay away from conflicts of interest. And I'm super friendly to people. Like, I'll give you the shirt off my back. That's the way I am. But at the same time, no right? It will never come to like our connections versus my advocating for the well-being of my client ever. I don't care. I don't like you that much, right? Like I just don't. <laughs> I like my kid a lot more than I like you. And sometimes you're going to say things that like will live on in infamy forever. Like my Titanic reference. <laughs> it's not the infamous. Thing. Michael Phelps again. <laughs> yeah. I was like, I said this in the middle of an IEP meeting. I'm like, Great, you do have awesome teachers, but even if I put Michael Phelps on the Titanic, he's still gonna drown. I got no care. Because I was making an analogy, like even if you're the best person, if you don't have the resources, you can't do it. Yeah. So our first need is always to make sure the foundation of the environment is well, because we know the best of services doesn't make up for the worst of environments, which is why just Jesse, like that was my big thing with you. Is he really in the right setting? Because, and you know when you'll know? How about during coronavirus? You have a child with an ABA tutor all the time. Guess what? They love public school. Yeah. They're not going to be able to survive during coronavirus and keeping up with the schedule of what they, they had there. So. All righty, guys. I'm going to let you go because I got to do my billing sheet. Let me stop recording. <laughs>